And tonight we're presenting uh, Jim Montgomery and Jim Light of the uh, South Bay uh, Parkland Conservancy. And uh, they're here to talk to us about uh, what they do, and in particular, the Esplanade Buff Bluff Restoration Project. So Jim and Jim, take it away. Well, thank you, Brent. We're, we're very pleased to be here tonight and honored to be invited to speak. And thanks to everybody who uh, dialed in or Zoomed in, whatever the current term is, to, uh, to hear us out tonight. We're excited to be here. Um, so I'm Jim Light, the president, and um, my co-presenter will be Jim Montgomery. Um, Jim, I don't know if you want to say a few words before I uh, dive into this briefing. Uh, no, I'll say a few words when it comes to my part. Okay, so you're going to get the Jim and Jim show from the SBPC tonight. So Jim, might as well just dive into it and uh, go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, so a little background on the Conservancy. Um, we were formed in 2004 as a nonprofit. We were actually, we were actually formed uh, by the mayor, uh, the current mayor of Redondo Beach, who was just another of us activists uh, at the time. And uh, we were formed primarily uh, in the beginning because there was no, there was no voice or advocacy for Parkland um, with regard to uh, um, what we were hoping um, to go, would go into the um, Redondo Power Plant site. Um, Bill and I started to put the data together to show that that power plant was no longer needed. Uh, we knew that the power plant um, uh, owner, AES, wanted to repower there and to also put a bunch of condos there. And so we really started more on the advocacy and the um, uh, uh, policy side to ensure that as properties became available, we were looking to expand, to preserve what um, parks that we had and public open space we had and to expand them onto new areas. So that was our initial impetus to start the organization. Um, when we wrote up the mission statement, it was to preserve, enhance, and expand parkland in the South Bay, um, which we view as uh, from PV uh, up to, um, it depends on the project, but PV up to Manhattan Beach and El Segundo, uh, and as far in as right now as Torrance and, and uh, Alondra Park. So that's kind of the area and the mission. Our strategic thrust right now uh, number one is to restore and expand native habitat in the area. Uh, the second is to establish the Redondo Beach Community Garden. Redondo Beach did not have a community garden, uh, and we're going to use that as a, 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 a leapfrog. Our community garden is both a, a place where people can come in, rent a plot, and plant whatever they want, as long as it's not cannabis, according to the city rules. Um, but we're going to have a large portion of it as a hillside. We're going to plant that with native plants and put interpretive signs up so those folks who are gardening out there will also learn about native plants. So we're gonna feed the people and we're gonna feed the insects and flora and fauna of the area. Um, the third is where, where we started to influence public policy, um, uh, advocate for public parkland, recreation and open space, and also uh, to change uh, plant palettes um, to include, er to ensure we protect mm -hmm. urban forests and to gradually shift the native plants in the, uh, in the city's plant palettes. And then finally, a, a very important one that we all take to heart is uh, educating the public, particularly the next generation of kids that'll be taking over uh, as we um, uh, move on. Okay, next slide. So just uh, from, a, from a big overview perspective, this is kind of a map that lays down our, our major projects right now. I'll start up in the, uh, uh, up in the upper right. Um, we just recently finalized the um, agreement with the county to take over uh, uh, establishing and maintaining uh, a native plant area on the island that's there in the middle of a, a large pond in Alondra Park. Um, Jean Bellman, I saw you're on tonight. Jean is really the person who started that, and we're just following in her footsteps and providing the um, all the legal coverage and the uh, insurance and things like that to uh, um, to to continue and to expand what she has built through the years. Um, next on the left there, you see Hermosa Greenbelt uh, Native Habitat. That's one of our newer projects. Um, 
we got a donation from um, a, a resident in the area who wants to remain, remain, remain anonymous, uh, provided that we spend that on putting native habitat on the green belt where he walks with his daughter. Um, within two weeks, we got, um, we got approval from the city of Hermosa Beach. And within a month, we had our agreement with them. And we've got about a third, third of an acre planted and we'll be moving on from that in, uh, in April as uh, Leadership Hermosa has funded a, a, new, a new section to be uh, restored on along that green belt. Um, there was a fun project we did, which was a Girl Scout project called at a place called Fort Lots of Fun. Um, they wanted to put in a pollinator garden for the monarch butterflies. And um, it was fun because we started with uh, uh, briefing them. I went with five slides because these are eight to 10 year olds. And they actually uh, had us there for an hour and a half asking questions. And they took over, they totally redesigned the garden. Garden. We taught them how to use Calscape to pick plants. Uh, and they came out with the plant layout and the plant list. And, uh, and then they actually executed what they planned. So um, that was a fun project to see these, these little girls get excited about learning about the plants and then picking them themselves. And they were much more vested in the project because of that. Um, Let's see, we've got Hirondo Park um, establishing a, a, a native habitat there. Um, that is not a, a project that's completed. We were working more on the policy side, but last year, uh, the city of Redondo did finally get an agreement with uh, Southern California Edison to put uh, native plants underneath the power lines going on the west side of PCH, uh, where the power lines go into the power plant. And that's about a five acre site. Uh, I just commented on the city's uh, plant palette for that. Um, they weren't, they weren't going to plant the right plants. And so uh, I'm glad we got to intervene on that. We've got the, the mayor's support on ensuring that they do plant the right plants and that we should start seeing them plant in the next few months. So uh, they missed kind of the rainy season here, but uh, it will be an irrigated site. And I believe the contract is for half of the five acres to start. Um, next, right below that is the old Salt Lake, the wetlands and habitat, and that is uh, tearing down that old uh, decrepit uh, power plant and um, replacing it with as much wetlands and native habitat as we can get. Um, when AES applied for a new power plant, we did intervene and um, uh, got the Coastal Commission involved and we documented along with Audubon Society that there was actually um, wetlands coming back in the site. Uh, AES had shut down their dewatering pumps and where the retention ponds were for the old oil tanks that were long ago removed, water started coming back up. And between uh, Audubon Society and ourselves, we documented 130 species of, of birds using the area, the wetlands that are there. And the Coastal Commission designated at least six acres have to be um, wetlands when no matter what goes in there in the future along with a buffer zone. We've also been lobbying with the state officials for um, that have to do with power. And we believe Redondo has had its last extension and will shut down uh, in um, December, at the end of December this year. And AES has stated publicly they're committed to shutting down. So we're still watching that because a developer did buy it. That developer just went into bankruptcy. And so we're working with the city to make sure as much of that can be a uh, park as, as possible. Um, the next one down a little bit on the right there, our first project where we delved into um, getting away from just policy and getting into native plants uh, is Wilderness Park. And I'll cover that in a little bit, in a, in a little bit more detail. Uh, but right now we've got about three acres uh, converted to native habitat and we're expanding that to, an, to the fourth acre uh, through, through this year. And that's been a real success story. Um, Below that is the Alta Vista Community Garden. Uh, I, I talked about that, that Redondo had no community garden. We advocated for it. They're now building the community garden. We hope to open it up in May. And right next to that is uh, the elementary school there wanted a native pollinator garden. So we planted our first uh, 10 foot by 30 foot section and we've done three more of those since then. And those are in different levels of maturity. And we use that to teach the kids at Alta Vista Elementary School about the value of native plants. Um, and then below that at the bottom is Jim's uh, Esplanade Bluff uh, Habitat Restoration, uh, which he will cover in a lot more detail. So I won't, I won't steal his thunder there. 
And just to the north of that, the county did approach us to put in a demonstration garden uh, at the north end of the Redondo Bluff, uh, right next to where the condos uh, start growing up. They did not want that to be representative of neighborhood habitat. They wanted nice looking flowers that would bloom year, years um, around the year. And so that's what we put in. It's not reflective of what would have been on the bluff, but it is a beautiful garden. And it has gotten us on the map. We, we installed an interpretive sign on that. We get queries regularly about what kind of plants are in there and how other people can do that at their yards. So that's a, a rough overview of our biggest planting projects. Uh, any questions on that before I, I move on? Okay, next slide, Jim. So this is the SPPC by the numbers in 2022. Uh, we planted over 4,000 plants last year. Um, and the people who planted those plants were over 1,000 volunteers, uh, over 134 events, about, oh, that's over two events each week. And the total volunteer hours, as you can see, there is uh, uh, over 2,500 volunteer hours. We're quite certain we'll exceed that in 2023. So uh, we keep growing these numbers every year and now we're formally tracking them. So this has been a real success story. In fact, right now, um, you know, our, our biggest problem is finding leads for the projects because uh, we don't want to burn people like Jim out who have taken over projects. Next slide. Another key component, I talked about the strategic thrust earlier and, and we really value educational programming. I noticed Mary Simon is on tonight. She is our primary lead in that area. Um, whenever we do a volunteer session, we do some upfront training on the plants they'll be planting and why they're important and how to do what they're gonna do at the planting or the weeding sessions. We hold a, 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 a two day Earth Day event every year that includes nature walks and seminars uh, as well as boothing by different environmental organizations. Um, Mary uh, has held classes at Redondo Union High School. Um, we have, she, she conducts month, monthly nature walks in a junior urban naturalist program at Wilderness Park. Uh, we have conducted, conducted planting sessions at Alta Vista Elementary School uh, with the kids in the school. Um, we've done ad hoc training. I talked about training the girls on the uh, uh, monarch how to build their monarch garden. And Mary spearheaded our first uh, uh, effort at getting a scholarship going and we're hoping to grow that through the years. Um, Mary, since you're on, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Oh, I think that is a big no. Um, Hi, no, sorry, oh, there you I couldn't go. figure out how there to turn go, on the speaker microphone. No, thank you, that was great. Thank you very much for talking about the educational program. Yeah, the picture on the right there is from our Earth Day last year, and it's one of our guys who's now moved on to uh, the Forestry Service, um, given a plant, uh, 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 in, uh, a seminar, a uh, hands-on seminar on how to glean seeds from native plants. So you can see that was attended by about 20 folks, and Mary conducted several walks, uh, and that was a very successful program last year. We appreciate everything Mary does. Um, next slide, please. Oh, um, I, I mentioned before, before this all started, we are uh, a, a big supporter of extending habitat for the endangered El Segundo blue butterfly fly. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's about the size of your fingernail, has a short breeding season from May to July. There are about, there are about five main populations of the El Segundo blue, uh, Palos Verdes, the Redondo Bluffs, uh, the Chevron, um, refinery in El Segundo, uh, the LAX Preserve, and then the Bologna Wetlands. Uh, and their ho only host plant, uh, what their, their caterpillars feed on, their larvae feed on, is sea cliff buckwheat, Aragonum uh, parvifolium. So um, they almost went extinct. They were endangered. And uh, we've, uh, we're a founding member of a group of organizations now that is the El Segundo Blue Butterfly Coalition. And our goal is to expand the current habitats and also to link those habitats. So SBPC is working Redondo and Hermosa um, and the green belt in Hermosa is a key corridor for connectivity between Redondo's population 
and the populations in El Segundo. And so that's why we're focused so much on getting that green belt uh, expanded. Um, to the north of us, Bay, Bay Foundation is working uh, the dunes in Manhattan Beach and, and, and projects to the north of that. So um, PVPLC is part of this coalition. They're taking care of PV. So yeah, um, we're trying to work the linkage so that we can connect those disparate populations um, so we can get genetic diversity in the species. Okay, next slide. Jim, I thought I saw a question pop up. Can you read? I can't read it right now. The Mary already answered it. Okay. Okay. And perfect. I'm, and I'm, I've been answering things in chat as we go as well. Okay. Um, we do have an Earth Day event this year coming up on Saturday, April 22nd, and Sunday, the April 23rd. The first day will include workshops um, and rec uh, some walks and restoration, and then we'll have dinner and a, and a formal celebration program along with overnight camping. And then the second day is a, a broader community event. We'll have lunch, activities and crafts. We'll have some lot, two bands playing down in the amphitheater in Wilderness Park. And then we'll have uh, um, several uh, local environmental organizations um, uh, that will be putting up booths in the park. And we certainly would love to have uh, CNPS there in any way that uh, uh, you see fit. We could. We can certainly make room for a booth there. We don't charge anything for you to set up a booth. Or uh, if you're interested, we can. We have time set aside on Saturday that you could give a seminar on native plants or a specific aspect of native plants uh, if you're interested. So I would ask you to come back to us fairly quickly if you are interested in uh, participating in this event. It's one uh, that is growing with each year since uh, we, we, we had it going before COVID, we shut it down. Last year was our biggest year. It was our first one after COVID, was our biggest one ever, and this year is even bigger. So um, we'd love to have you guys involved. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over two, just to kind of showcase two of our projects with more, more or less pictures. And then, uh, but I'm gonna go through those very quickly and then I'll let Jim have the, the podium for the rest of the time. So um, our, the first highlight is the Hermosa Green Belt. Um, the original funding, as I said before, came from an anonymous local resident, started in June of last year from 2nd to 6th Street in Hermosa, if you're familiar with the Green Belt. Uh, and then just recently, we were selected by Leadership uh, um, Hermosa for their project um, uh, starting at Hirondo Street. We've also applied uh, and made it for, through the first gate for a $1.9 million grant from the Coastal Conservancy to convert 50% of the Hermosa Green Belt. The picture on the right is our first planting day. Those are um, all volunteers and uh, some of the folks from Public Works and from the city, uh, other parts of the city staff brought their kids out and the public came out, the mayor came out uh, and we planted 250 plants in uh, under two hours. And in the one case up to the uh, to the end that you can't see there, it did involve pulling out a lot of uh, weeds and and ice plants. So we got all that done in just a couple hours. Since then, we've expanded to about a third of the acre, of, of an acre. Um, and, and it's not contiguous, it's spots along, along the, um, between second and sixth streets. Our goals with the project are to rewild with native habitat, provide that connective corridor for the El Segundo blue butterfly. Hermosa, unlike Redondo, Redondo and um, Manhattan, and El Segundo does not have any bluffs or dunes uh, to speak of in their city. So that's why we chose this site that's inland. It's an old railroad um, uh, line that they've turned into a green belt. Uh, and so we're hoping that that becomes the bridge to connect the Redondo populations to the El Segundo uh, populations. As we were starting to research for this project, we discovered that they also uh, have an overwintering population of, of monarch butterfly. So we altered our plant palette to ensure that we had food available for those overwintering monarch butterflies. And we're also participating with the city and community education and stewardship. Next slide, please. This just shows uh, as uh, with the rains, we're having a, um, a mini super bloom. Uh, on the site. The one on the left is uh, uh, around 4th Street, 
And you can see some lupins in there along with tidy tips and baby blue eyes. And same thing on the uh, right at 2nd Street, right at uh, uh, where you uh, cross the street to get into the green belt. Uh, and same, same flowers you see there, there's some encilia in there and also some poppies had started blooming. Since then, we've seen more poppies blooming in the, uh, the big area we've done at the 4th Street site. Next, next slide. And this is, our, this is our showcase. If you haven't been to Wilderness Park, um, I'd encourage you to go there. Uh, we started this, uh, actually, um, our conservation director, Jacob um, Varvarigos, and the guy who actually helped me replant my yard with native plants, a uh, landscaper who since, pa since passed away, Bill Pettit, uh, had a vision for converting Wilderness Park, which was almost entirely non-natives, uh, into a showcase for native habitat. So to date, um, we're in, we're, we've rewilded three acres with our fourth acre in work. The plants are funded by the city of Redondo. Uh, since we started in 2017, we've seen the return of the Western Bluebird, the Akmon blue, blue Butterfly, which we think came from Madrona Marsh, and Dragonflies that we think uh, came over from um, Madrona Marsh. So we're already seeing species come back as we rewilded uh, this area. Uh, our goals there are rewild with native habitat. Uh, this is also an overwintering site for the monarch butterfly. So provide ha uh, food for them in winter. And um, uh, also to encourage community education and stewardship. And we, we get a lot of repeat people coming back with their kids. We've got high schools participating here. We've had uh, a lot of folks helping us with this. Uh, on the bottom right there, that hillside is the first area we planted. That's about a third of an acre. Uh, that was all ice plant and grass. And now we barely have to weed it. The, the native plants have taken over and are expanding. The main maintenance we have to do in this area is actually cutting them back to keep the trails open through the, the native plants. Uh, on the upper left uh, is a, a bluff that's there that we planted with uh, sea cliff buckwheat. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get the El Segundo blue there, but that is where the Akmon blue uh, showed up on the site. That was actually a, an Eagle Scout project um, that started there. And we've been maintaining it since the Eagle Scouts did the first planting. So that gives you kind of an idea of the kind of projects we're tackling um, and, and why we tackle them. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to talk about, uh, to, to, to talk with the rest of our time, talk about the um, bluff uh, that we're restoring in Redondo. Great, thanks a lot, Jim, for that. Um, any questions for Jim before I uh, take off on the deep dive? Okay, hearing none. Um, I first just wanna echo Jim's statement at the beginning. I really am grateful to South Coast California Native Plant Society for hosting us tonight. Um, I think we're all kindred spirits in our love of native plants. And I definitely wanna give a shout out to Tony Baker Connie Vadheim and Tracy Drake. Um, the three of them are giants in my mind, and they were three seminal people in instilling a love of California natives um, in me. So, so thank you all. And then I see a lot of our familiar names on here as well. So it's nice to be here with uh, old friends and uh, with uh, new friends as well. So I'm going to dive into it. I've got about three or four slides that have uh, words, and then it's going to be a whole lot of pictures over the last year. I, I became the project lead just over a little, little over a year ago. And I gotta tell you all, it's, it's, it's a dream. It's to be there at the Bluffs um, um, building community as we restore habitat and help rewild the South Bay um, is just, um, it just feeds my soul and it's, it's wonderful. And you meet the most amazing people. I see a number of our volunteers on as well. So thank you all. It's really the volunteers that make this go. Um, but anyway, this started you know, with Ann Dalkey and Travis Longfor um, when they put together the Beach Bluffs Restoration Project Master Plan. Um, and here's the plan on the left. Um, it's online, you can search for it and find it. And it really laid out a really nice plan for how we we're gonna go ahead and restore natural diversity along the remnant dunes and bluffs along San Maca Bay between Bayona Creek, all the way south of PV Peninsula. And the master plan has three, these following goals. We wanna increase the ecological value of the Beach Bluffs by restoring native vegetation, we want to increase recreational value by providing stewardship opportunities for restored bluffs. And that's what we do with our, our volunteer um, 
um, events as well as um, and leads um, butterfly walks. And then that's, which is the last thing, providing a public education program about the Beach Plus and their coastal environment. And then this is kind of neat too. It's very much a collaborative effort. Um, the Espan Bluff portion here in the South. And actually, let me back up a step. There's really three main areas for this project. There's us in the South, uh, Redondo and Torrance. Um, the middle there is Manhattan Beach. And in the North is the Bono Wetlands area. Um, so, that's kind of the picture. And so we're in the South part. Um, and it's now a collaborative effort um, involving US Fish and Wildlife Service, LA County Beaches and Harbors, City of Redondo Beach, LA Conservation Corps, and SBPC, we're kind of the glue or the hub um, that you know, all the spokes kind of connect to. Um, and so in 2021, US Fish and Wildlife requested that SBPC take a more active role in the project. And since then, we've been organizing volunteer events to remove invasive species and install and maintain species native to the dunes and bluff habitat. And in 2022, uh, they gave us a four-year ADK grant for these efforts. So that was a, really a, a vote of confidence in what we've been able to do down there. And so what I'm gonna show now, that our results were approximately one year from March 12th, 2022 to April 2nd, 2023, just yesterday. Got some great shots down there. Um, so, Here's the, um, the area we're focused in. It's uh, polygons eight and nine. You see kind of right here. Can you guys see my arrow moving around? Yes. Great. Yeah, so polygon eight. And so polygons are delineated by hardscape. So these are basically ramps going down. This is the Esplanade up here. So the street level. And then there's Miramar Park right here. And then going down to the bluffs or, you know, here's the bluffs um, basically bordered by the strand and the Esplanade. And so this is where we're doing all of our restoration. And so in year one, we've been doing um, eight and nine, which is about three acres. LA Conservation Corps, our partners, they've been doing um, 10 and 11, which is essentially Avenue I to L Avenue G. Um, and then we, South Bay Parkland, are gonna be doing another 2.5 acres, 12, 13, and 14 in over the next three years, um, starting in the fall of this year. So once all said and done, that's gonna be about restoring about, um, about seven acres of habitat all the way from Miramar Park, Vista Del Mar, all the way north to Avenue um, C. So that's very exciting to me. And my long-term vision is all two miles of bluff coastline rewilded. That's what I really wanna see. And just imagine the biodiversity of life that's gonna show up right as we um, get rid of the invasive ice plant and restore it with natives. So here's the palette. This um, has been updated a little bit from what Ann and Travis came up with um, years ago. Um, so here's, here's the list. Um, there's a mixture of perennials and annuals. Um, and the rightmost column is the number of perennials planted to date, 811. Um, one gallon pots we've planted so far. You know, and the thing that's gonna be interesting to me is to see which plants do well down at the bluffs. You know, we're, we're experimenting right now as we put new plants in. You know, some are doing great. You know, the Encelia Californica, love it down there. Uh, big salt bush. Or, seems to do very well. Um, Primrose is going nuts. Um, the beach burr as well. Um, but the um, Artemisia californica is suffering a bit. So we'll see if it can make a go of it down there or not. We'll find out. Um, but yeah, so 811 plants in the ground as of just Saturday. And we've also thrown in about 13 pounds of wildflower seeds just south of the um, Avenue I restroom. And so you'll, you'll see that down there. We've got, as Jim coined the term, we've got a little mini super bloom going down there right now. So you'll see some pictures. So this was back in March of 2022. Um, and we had just, you know, kind of gotten started. Um, but here's um, some pictures, really nice view looking south towards the peninsula. And there's a very nice um, in city of California that was installed by LACC some number of years ago. Um, got a lemonade berry there, doing quite well. Um, and this is neat, right? I mean, back in March of last year, seeing a great egret um, down there um, looking for lizards and other critters. And so I've got a nice little video of this guy or gal uh, walking around on the bluffs. Uh, let's see. Got some bandwidth issues here, it looks like, unfortunately. i try that again now that it's loaded. Maybe a little bit faster this time. Now oh, it's pretty choppy. I apologies for that. Okay, I'll move to the next slide. Or try to anyway. There we go. Okay, so here's the uh, one of the star attractions, right? The sea cliff buckwheat, 
the Ariaganum parvifolium. And this is, as Jim had always mentioned, this is the host plant for the caterpillar. And so we're putting a lot, about 30% is the goal um, down at the bluffs for the plan. Um, here's a very nice established bladder pod, I, one of my favorites. You know, they, they bloom for quite some time, providing a nice um, um, habitat for the, the pollinators. Um, and this is our first purchase, our first native to plant the bluffs. So 150 plants. Um, so we did a mixture of saltgrass, bush sunflower, beach evening primrose, and beach burr. Um, and so here we are. Um, there's Jacob, our director of conservation that Jim mentioned over by his van. And then here we are loading up the, the, the plants and getting them down to the bluff. And so here we are now. Um, this is just a little bit south of the Avenue I restroom. And this is our first restoration. And actually there in the foreground, um, smiling with the plant in his hand, that's Roger Clem. He's actually a colleague of mine at JPL. And he's actually one of my, um, also one of my native plant gurus. He's done a tremendous job up at JPL, getting us to actually um, convert a lot of our landscape to natives, which is nice. Um, so it's nice to see that at JPL. Um, and here we are just, you know, after we, you know, digging them in, um, so, you know, dig the holes, fill the holes full of water, let them drain a few times to get a nice reservoir of water there, and then get the plants put in the ground. And there you are looking south from the Avenue I restroom, about 150 plants we got put in that day. Um, there we are watering them in as we've planted them. Um, and one thing I enjoy is just seeing all the, the existing uh, biodiversity of life that's down here. And so there's quite a few lizards down there. And this guy um, did a nice job of posing for me as I took this picture. Um, already quite a nice um, amount of local uh, California poppies down there. Um, so this we, we did not plant these, they were, they were already there. Well, I, somebody did, I don't think it was official. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say is it was not I. <laughs> So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure, Mary. Yeah, the Camasonia does very well down there in Verbena too. Um, yeah, and actually, Mary, yeah, definitely, if you want to chime in, Mary, on what, what you've done in the past there, or oh, you direct message to me. But yeah, Mary, mm -hmm. um, definitely involved early on uh, mm -hmm. down in Torrance. You want to say some words, Mary? Oh, no, you're doing fine. I just wanted to remind you that those two did well, and I don't remember planting a lot of Artemisia down there. Yeah, I, I think it's not going to make it, unfortunately. So I, I do like it, but yeah, it doesn't do so well down the bluffs. I'm excited uh, that this project has been picked up again and is continuing because our dream was always, as yours is, to revegetate that entire bluff region. So I'm just beyond delighted that you're picking this up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I am truly standing on the shoulders of giants, and you're, you're some shoulders I'm standing on too as well, Mary. So thank you for your efforts. And this was kind of neat, right? So we put the we, we put the plants down on the 26th, and two days later we got some rain. So that was always nice. So um, got the rains there. Jim, yeah, something was... something I'm going to jump in on you if you don't mind. Yeah, certainly, please do. Um, what you see there is not the bluff as it would normal. It did, it didn't look this way when Jim showed up. Um, he and the volunteers did a lot of clearing of weeds before those planting sessions, and that's why it looks so clean. Um, now with the rains, it doesn't look so clean. A lot of weeds popped up, but they did a lot of work to strip as many weeds as they could before they went into planting. And the other thing I wanted to mention, Jim, maybe you can go into it deeper, is um, we're kind of a test case because they, the biologist for this, Ann Dalkey, would prefer four-inch plants, and we're, we're planting gallon plants, and I'll let you cover it from there, Jim. Yeah, certainly. I think one, the nice thing is, right, since we have volunteers, we have the luxury of nurturing them until they get established. But you'll really see in some of the time progressions how rapidly you can actually get coverage um, on the bluffs with one gallon pots and supplemental watering. And so here's, um, and I got to say, I love salt grass. Didn't know about salt grass till a year ago. It's not something I have here at my, in my yard in the Lower Riviera, but boy, it does a great job of, um, you know, erosion control, spreads by rhizomes. And it just loves it down at the beach as well as you would expect. It's, you know, that's its habitat. Um, bush sunflower in Celia Californica. I uh, got the beach burr and I love the beach burr too. They have some pretty, very pretty flowers that you'll see a little bit later in the talk. Um, and then the beach evening primrose. That, that was, probably shouldn't have bought that. There's quite the seed bank down there already. And I think the same thing with the beach burr too. We're going to dial that back somewhat and just, you know, gather seeds and spread them out. Um, but here we back, you know, back in uh, April of last year, a really pretty wildflower display. 
you know, and as, as I think of a lot of you know, right, is that I've been telling everybody, you know, the rains have been great for the natives, but they've also unfortunately been great for the invasives. And I've got a picture of this area now where the weeds are really taking over. And that's what we're going to be turning our attentions from. We've been putting in planting, you know, during the rainy season, but boy, we really got our work cut out for us to try and get on top of these weeds and just try and, you know, keep knocking down that seed bank of the, of the invasive weeds. So here we are, yeah, right? So we put them in and we maintain them. So um, got some rains, so we come back in, we kind of like rebuild the berms. We go ahead and, you know, we, we like to take and mulch the plants to keep the weeds down and, um, and um, help with maintaining moisture. And so that's kind of what we're doing here because uh, we did get some pretty decent rains um, after we had planted. And of course, removing invasive weeds. Um, when they don't have seed heads, we leave them right on site, you know, so the organic matter will break down and help with, you know, moisture retention and, and, and such. But uh, the sea rocket there, um, they were already well-formed seed heads, so we got rid of that stuff. Um, and here's the beech burr in bloom, just, you know, a short uh, month and a half later. Really pretty. Um, I was really pleased to see this. Um, and there's the primrose in bloom, a nice carpet of primrose looking south from Avenue I in Polygon 9. And as I think someone mentioned as well, the verbena, just a really nice contrast, the pink of the verbena against the yellow of the primrose, very pretty. And does a very nice job of spreading out um, coverage. And the hawks are loving it down there. I think with the lizards and the, the gophers and other things, they are, um, someone told me there's like three of them down there now, they've seen it once. So that's pretty nice. And here's that hawk being chased away by crows. I think I um, have a video of it. Let's see if that, it's probably gonna be choppy, unfortunately, but we'll see. Yeah, that's, that's too bad. Sorry about that again. But yeah, so the, um, you to see the, uh, the crows, um, they worry the, the, the hawks quite frequently. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you kind of growth progression. Um, so this is um, May of, you know, May 20th, so about two months later. And these are the one gallon pots we planted, right? And so you kind of saw them when we put them in and they're already spreading quite nicely, um, taking off um, and starting to cover. So we got the salt grass a little bit higher up there on the slopes, got the uh, beech burr mounting out, the primrose as well. And there you go, just, you know, so not even a month later, you kind of get a sense of how fast um, the beech burr and the primrose are spreading out. So that's quite nice. And then um, mature irrigation system there, Jim. I'm sorry. You want to talk about a little bit about your irrigation system you set up there? <laughs> so uh, we're lucky there's an existing uh, irrigation system there from 10 years ago. We're unlucky there's an existing irrigation system. There's a it springs leaks quite frequently, so I've become quite adept at um, fixing um, the irrigation system. But yeah, so what we've done is we've actually tapped off of that. And we have tap points where we have male hose thread and we can put in, um, you know, connect to it with our hose and hand water the plants. And we also have some micro spray that will go ahead and do some overhead watering um, to uh, cover a, a greater area. So there's a, there's a trade there, right? I mean, you're, when you hand water, you have much more targeted watering. It's less water usage um, and you don't really feed the weeds, but it's very time intensive. So we're kind of playing with that, you know, doing the overhead watering, you cover a lot more ground, but now you got to go ahead and stay on top of the weeds. So anyway, so yeah, now looking north of the Avenue I restroom, there's a really nice mature um, sea cliff buckwheat. Um, and then you've got the, in the background there, I believe that was actually a, a pretty decent artemisia. So that one's doing okay. And, you know, I think if it gets protected from the winds, it does better. So, you know, we'll, we'll experiment there. But yeah, this part of the bluff is really nicely mature from um, prior plantings. There's a lot of salt bush there in Celia Californica, um, doing well. And of course the buckwheat um, has been planted quite thickly. And this is kind of neat now, right? You know, the public you know, getting very excited about seeing the El Segundo Blue down there um, at the bluffs. And here's just somebody who took some pictures and um, posted them on Instagram. So, and this is right down there, um, you know, right at Torrance Beach. So really, really beautiful. Now things are starting to dry up, right? August, um, and as you expect, right, they go summer dormant and we let them go summer dormant. As a matter of fact, we can't go in. Um, we basically, um, as part of the contract, you know, you don't want to um, interfere with the uh, El Segundo Blues um, mating season. So in May, we stop, um, we let them do their things. We look from afar and then we come back um, in, in September um, to start again. 
And now here you go, November, right? Really, you know, the rains haven't come yet and things are really kind of, um, they're, they're, they're basically dormant. So now uh, <laughs> the, the, we are back in in October, right? And here is a Russian thistle. I think this one took the prize. Uh, Tom, I see you on. Um, so yeah, we, we had fun getting rid of the Russian thistle. Um, it's it's really the only one that really has a lot of thorns and you have to deal with, but boy, it, it was it did well. So we were really focused on getting that one out. Um, and this was fun. Um, a bunch of house sparrows, right? Making use of the bladder pod um, for, um, for um, shelter and um, forage. So, yeah. yeah when, the, when the hawks come around, those those sparrows go inside those plants to hide from yeah. them. Yeah. Well, that's really choppy. That's too bad. Yeah. So it's a, a nice video of the um, the birds there. You know, the sparrows using the um, the um, the bush there. Then they um, took through the coop. All right, so then I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we've got um, LA Conservation Corps. Um, they're doing polygons 10 and 11. And so this was back in January um, and they've basically uh, you know, planting, they've removed the invasive ice plant from there and they've been planting, um, but boy, the, the weeds are really taken off there. So they've got their work cut out for them to uh, get the weeds out. And so I, I think you all right. Any of you that made it down to the bluffs saw the, uh, the aftermath of our winter storm surge, uh, pretty amazing um, with the storm surge coming all the way to the bluffs, you know, bringing sand all the way up onto the bike path there. Um, but one thing about that was kind of neat was, you know, just seeing how the native plants resist the erosion from the surge. You know, get the beech burr down here in the foreground and um, the primroses along here as well. But where there's no plants, right, it sort of eats away at the sand. So that's the vision here, right, and getting, getting the native plants all throughout there. Um, so yeah, you can see the beech burr, right? It did a very nice job of, of, of basically resisting the erosion. So now the other thing that we kind of talked about, right, was just um, getting the youth involved. And so uh, Ms. Moberg at um, Redonda Union, she has an AP Environmental Sciences class. And this was, um, this was a controlled chaos kind of day. I think we had about 50 students come out over the course of four hours. So that was a bit much, but they, they really did a number um, on the weeds. Um, and then we also got them, of course, planting as well. So here's three of the youth um, putting an artemisia into the ground. Um, at the same time, we came across a potato bug, which they didn't appreciate too much. I did, but they <laughs> they were a little freaked out by it. And so here's a, just a group shot. Uh, you know, so we got, there's a, and actually Kendra's online. Uh, she's one of our volunteers. Um, so thank you, Kendra, for all you do to help. There's Jim. And then there's a uh, Roger I talked about earlier. Um, and I'm in here somewhere. I'm not sure where. Oh, and then there's um, Susan Graven, another one of our um, volunteers. And then a whole bunch of uh, Ms. Moberg students. And there's Ms. Moberg right there. So, and here's the second group that came in um, and did the restoration. So really fun to get the youth involved. Gray whale, and I'm sure this is not going to play well, but this is really kind of neat. There was a, a, a young gray whale sort of frolicking in the surf. You know, I think I, I have my VPN. There it VPN, is. Yeah, this other little nose stick up. I've got my VPN on. Maybe I should turn that off. Um, ah. Oh, well. We'll skip that. Let's see. So let's go. Ahead. Oh, yeah. Then we had, um, yeah, then there's a close-up of the buckwheat um, in January. Um, Dudley. I really love the Dudley. This is a really nice um, stand of, of, of that growing on the bluffs. And this is in January as well. Um, and then some new plants we started putting in, um, put in some purple sage, the salvia lacophila. Actually, how do you pronounce that? So, somebody tell me. Lucophila, lucophila, how do you pronounce that one? Okay, I guess I'll find out later. However you want to. Lucophila. <laughs> <laughs> lucophila, thank you. We'll go with that. <laughs> I say lucophila. You, you say <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. We'll call the whole thing off. There we go. Okay. And then, yeah, the lupins are really doing well down there. Love this one. Just very pretty. Um, and there's a nice um, a nice stand of it. And this one, which is great, right? This is one of the plants down there that can actually choke out the ice plant, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and then um, now I'm just going to show you. I love it. <laughs> right. Do some work for us. 
So now what you're going to see here is just kind of a rapid fire from March to, yeah, I can't, it's, it boggles my mind what our team has done just in the last couple of months. We've put in just a tremendous number of plants. Um, we're over 811. We were at 150 at this point. So yeah, we went from 150 to 811 in just two, uh, a couple months. So we stage them before we before the, the volunteers show up. Um, I sort of put them out at the bottom and I sort of place them where I want them to be planted, which really speeds things up. We're, so we're kind of getting a, a nice rhythm going. So they're kind of just, you know, kind of placed. They got the blue flags there. You can see the, the volunteers now are just digging and planting. And we're getting to the point where we're putting like, you know, like a hundred plants in a little bit over an hour, which is great, which bodes well because the goal is about 1,250 plants for planting season over the next three years. We're gonna put about 3750 in over the next three years. So this kind of just shows you now looking north in Polygon 9 and where you see a blue flag, there's a plant. Um, and here's the natives, but they're choked with the invasives. So we got the, we've got the um, lupins in there, but as you can see, there's a whole host of other nasty invasives, um, sea rocket and other things. So this is a before and this is an after, um, so. Yeah, so, and yeah, so Brent, to your question, so we can't plant, we can't protect them once May rolls around. So um, so what we're trying to do, and we can't weed the whole thing. I mean, this is really crazy. Uh, so what we do is we call it defensible spaces. We try to like weed, you know, a couple feet radius around each plant. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. Um, and just try to make sure that we can give them, you know, especially the new ones, you know, enough of a time to establish themselves so they can fight off the weeds. But there's quite a few small buckwheat that LACC has planted that you know we've been liberating, um, completely covered by weeds. So that's where we're going to really focus our efforts, you know, between now and May is just trying to keep the plants um, as safe as possible so they can establish themselves. So this was kind of neat. Um, this is an abandoned beehive and some sea cliff buckwheat. Um, I remember seeing this, Jim, and I think you do too. Uh, the yeah. bees were, um, you know, in the fall were quite active. But with the rains, um, they um, they um, they abandon that hive, and this is cool too, right? This is what I just love. This part, you know, all the various flora and fauna we come across. And this, Susan Gravens uh, found this one as she was um, weeding, um, and then also um, a Jerusalem cricket, um, aka potato bug, uh, potato yeah, potato bug was there. So that's one thing that I'm looking forward to, right? Is you know coming across ever greater diversity of wildlife as we create ever greater diversity of plant life. Um, and so I really wanna see that happen. So here's our volunteers. Um, so we get a, a diversity each, each time. So this is us the, a week later preparing for volunteer day, getting the plants out, um, the shovels. And we're very fortunate that LA County being a partner, they actually have storage underneath the, um, their restrooms. So the day before I bring the plants down and we store all of our tools and everything there and we are able to go ahead and very quickly stage before folks show up in the morning. Um, so here we are, it was a nice foggy day on March 12th and just getting things staged. Um, and here's the plants that we uh, planted that day. So on the bottom row, you've got the, uh, the purple sage, the lemonade berry, deer weed. Um, I think that was a bladder pod. Then in the back, we got the artemisia, the, the sagebrush. Um, salt bush and the uh, California, uh, the bush sunflower. Let's see. Um, yeah, and yes, Brian, we're planting at the top of the slopes too for slope stabilization and downhill seeding and spread. And so that's actually, if you look at the the um, the, pro, the, the master plan that um, Travis and uh, Ann put together, um, there's it's it's a it's fascinating, right? I mean, the um, the microclimbs you have in just that hundred feet of um, vertical um, space. Now at the bottom, right, it's pure sand. And so the um, the primrose does very well down there. Well, the primrose does well everywhere, you know, but some of the other plants, the more shrubby stuff, they don't do as well. So we put them higher up on the plants. And um, let's see, well, there's, you guys are blowing up the chat, which is great. Um, but yeah, D, definitely weeding is the, the main problem right now. And yeah, the non-native grasses are going nuts. So we've really got to get on top of that. And Rosalie, um, so part of the, so we've right now sourced from three places, PV Peninsula, we've got the, the so for sure the sea cliff buck, we, we want the Chevron variety hyper local because we want that for the El Scundle Blue. And we did get other plants from PV, um, a PLC. We've also gotten plants from uh, Native West and also a Tree of Life Nursery. But I'm very happy to report that we've actually contracted with PV PLC um, to do a contract grow for us. 
and working with Johnny Perez there at PVLPC and his crew, they're going to be growing out a large fraction of our plants from native seed. And SBPC, our long-term vision is to have our own nursery um, and basically do our own gathering of seeds and basically do kind of what you all do with PVPLC and do it on Marsh, right? Get our own seed stock and grow hyper-local. So that's the plans. Great questions. Let me see if there, and yeah, Brent. So that's kind of the plans I kind of alluded to there. And let's see if we got, I'm gonna go back up in the chat here, make sure I haven't missed anything. Let's see, I think we got to everybody. Um, yep, I think I got all the questions. So Jim, uh, if I could jump in, you talked about the different, you know, what's above the fence line on the bluffs and what's below it and, and the change in, in, um, in the kind of plants. The, the plan uh, actually has um, plant, different plants designated for above the fence line uh, versus the, the more dune uh, type of, uh, of sand at the bottom. And what we see is there's a lot more clay as you, as you get to the steep part of the bluff. The reason it's steep is because there's a lot of clay in mixed in with the, the loamy sand there. Um, and so different different plants seem to take. I think also some you're more exposed to the wind the higher you, you are up there. And that may uh, result in different plants liking it or disliking it more. Yeah, you can definitely see how the plants get wind sculpted. You know, in my yard, my lemonade berry is about 10 feet tall. But the way at the bluffs, it's it's basically only a few feet tall. Uh, let's see. Um, I was gonna, oh yeah, so Rosalie, I, I referred to mulch. So what do you use? So this is where we make good use of the invasives. So before they go to seed, we go ahead and we uh, will use them as mulch. So the the sea rocket before they go to seed, they make great mulch. Um, there's also um, the um, ice plant. We'll chop that up um, and use that as well. And I'm not as Something I need to become better versed at is what the invasives are. We've got a bunch there. We've definitely got a lot of um, cheese weed right now that makes a nice mulch. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're doing. So we turn a bad thing into a good thing. Okay, and there, here we go again, just our volunteers. I, yeah, this is the lifeblood of what we do, right? We just couldn't do it without our volunteers. And I'm, I'm so grateful. I think now we've had um, over 400 volunteers at our events, many repeat volunteers. And we're approaching a thousand hours now at, the, at just the bluff in it in a little over a year. Um, and it continues to ramp up, which is great because we really have a lot of um, opportunity going forward. Yes. And Gene, yeah, very, very pleased that you're part of SBPC now too. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's kind of neat, right? We're kind of like the mycelium connecting all these efforts together. Everyone's been doing all this great work for so long, right? And that's really what I view SBPC as, is, you know, giving people opportunities you know, I think there's this hunger, you know, I think people really have this hunger to get, you know, reconnected to the, to the natural world. And so that's, um, that's one thing we really want to provide for people. Um, yeah, so Adela, the, the plan is to uh, <laughs> weed, 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 weed like crazy, you know, knock down the seed bank, let the, let the natives, you know, spread out and choke out. And so that's kind of the idea, you know, and hopefully that's that we'll, we'll see if we can get there. But boy, this this year, you can, the grasses especially, they're just driving me crazy. They're, they've put out some seed heads like crazy right now. And so um, we need to really get those, those seeds out of there so they can't build up their seed bank. And so the wildflowers are starting and that's just beautiful, right? You know, I just really love seeing, seeing them. So here's a nice baby blue eyes. Um, <laughs> uh, beach bird from seeds, this is awesome, right? You know, I, I, I went out last year when, all the beach burr was there with their, with their seeds. And as you know, beach burr, they're very, very prickery. Gotta be a little careful when you grab them. But I just went and distributed them up and down the, the bluffs. And it's really nice now to see them coming up from the seeds. You know, they germinate quite, quite prolifically. They're, they're, they're a good self-seeder. Um, here's a hawk. And I wasn't sure which one it was. It's TBD, didn't get a chance to figure it out. Does anyone know what kind of hawk this one is? Okay, so the most Hopefully. common down there is the, the, the red tail. Yeah, yeah. A, a young red tail, not three years old yet, no red tail, but the two white patches on the back help you to know it's a red tailed hawk. Beautiful, thank you, Roy. There'll be a few more questions that I think you can answer later on. Um, so this is a real nice shot that Dan Fort, one of our volunteers, got. Um, you know, you got the wildflowers there, you got the hawk, you got the guy riding on the bike, and you got the ocean in the background. It's just, I mean, just captured it all very nice. And that's one thing I want to do too, actually, is um, in iNaturalist, 
um, I want to create an Escalab Plus project. And so the idea is to get some science behind it, you know, start getting all the observations in there. And what I really want to see, right, is over time to see what new species show up um, and just show the value, you know, of planting um, a biodiversity of plants. Um, so that's kind of neat. And also actually Ann Dahlke and our, um, our um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, sponsor, um, Carolyn Lieberman, we do both native plant or plant surveys and butterfly surveys. And so Anne put out her report recently, and I think it's got like the last three or four years, and we saw a fourfold increase in the yellow to blue in just one year, I think going from 2021 to 2022. So that's super exciting, right? Plants it and they will come. And so I, you know, one thing I tell everyone is like, you know, you know, one of the goals here is to get the yellow scuttle blue off the endangered species list. And as a human being, isn't that so cool to think that you might be able to be a positive on a species and actually get it off the endangered species list. So that's that's one for the goals as well. So here's a spider. And so Roy, I'm not sure if you know this one, but it was kind of cool seeing this spider um, with this egg sack on it. And the video is going to not work, I'm sure. So we'll try. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it was just kind of nice watching this spider run around with its egg sack connected to it. So do you know what this one is, Roy? I'm not sure you might ask Gene too. I, I, it's kind of small. I can't get my screen to enlarge, but kind of looks a little bit like a wolf spider, but I'm not sure. Okay, and it really blends in nicely with the with the soil too, which I suspect is evolution <laughs> in, uh, in charge there. Um, let's see, Mary Simon, yeah, yeah, we're all volunteers. Um, we did get the grant from um, South Bay Parkland, I'm sorry, from uh, US Fish and Wildlife, got the 79K. Um, but so that pays for plants, that pays for tools, pays for irrigation supplies. Um, and it's also going to pay to get um, LACC to come down and rip out the invasive ice plant for us. And so it's kind of neat chatting with these LACC youth because um, they do a lot of things, right? They do like um, hazardous waste um, pickups. They do like um, oil drop off, um, but they love coming to the bluffs um, and, and doing restoration work. So it's kind of neat. So we're going to, or it was an orb weaver. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so um, let's see, uh, the fence was put there, Gerard, to stop all the cut throughs. People wouldn't go to the, um, to the um, sidewalks and ramps. They would just cut down the bluffs and there was a lot of erosion. So the fences are there to stop that. But eventually, right, I can, you, you can envision like fences of lemonade berry and fences of saltbush when we get filled in very nicely. And maybe the fence can come down someday and that would be kind of cool. Um, all great questions. Thank you, for, keep, keep them up. All right, let's see. So there's a hawk. Yeah, this one's gonna be kind of hard to see. Well, maybe maybe you can tell, Roy, is that 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 juvenile as well? It's got kind of like white on its tufts on its chest. It could be in the lights guarding probably where the belly band might be, but um, not sure, it's awfully small photo. But yeah. yeah, might be yeah. a red. Okay. And, and yeah. the spider might be, an, I think Cindy might be right, that might be an orb weaver just on the ground instead of up on the... Okay. Okay. Let's see. Adele, let's see. Let's see. Oh yeah, we're gonna have to be maintaining this forever. Yeah, it's um. I I think we have a job security. <laughs> okay. Let me speed this up a bit. I want to be respectful of people's times. It's eight thirty-five. How much more time do I have? So I can sort of time it. Oh, we've got twenty-five minutes. If you want to go to nine. Okay. Great. Yeah, we've we got just a lot of pictures here. So, and this is kind of cool now. Um, I mean, so this guy on the left is um, Jeff's on the right, a friend of mine for many years and a longtime volunteer. And I know Jeff is on as well. So thank you, Jeff, for all you do. He's my early morning, get down there at 7 a.m. buddy to get everything staged. So things go smoothly in the morning. So thank you, Jeff. And on the left, this guy, uh, Tig, just um, <laughs> wanted to chip in and randomly said, I'll, I'll help you move some plants. So it's, you know, it's really kind of neat. We've had people play volleyball. They want to come over and start planting, you know, and it's really just neat the way the, 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 the public just rallies around this project. Yeah, and we're seeing a change. When we first started, people were yelling stuff at us for peeling off ice plant, you know, saying we're tearing out the green. And now we're getting, like, like Jim said, volleyballers coming over after they're done and helping us plant. Yeah, and Mary Simon, you you got an open invitation. Uh, we've got a we've got an easy up down there with the SBPC canopy on it, and we'd love to have you come down with your uh, friend or foe handouts and uh, help educate the public. So you're always welcome. Let's see. All right, yeah. So now this is we're expanding the. So I was very excited to finally get the desert wishbone. We couldn't get that from PVLPC, and we couldn't get it from Native West, but Tree of Life Nursery had some. 
So we, we've got that one, we're putting that in there. And here's the lupins, and this is all kind of neat. So back in December, those 13 pounds of seed I talked about, you know, we had a nice seed planting day where we distributed them by seed or distributed them by hand um, along the bluff there south of Avenue I. And this is an area that we got weeded out pretty nicely. The cheese weed was kind of going crazy and some other nasty invasives, but we um, we um, got those weeded out in this area. So they look quite nice. But to the right, oh my gosh, it's you can kind of see the, the, the mounding of um, weeds to the right. And now volunteers, here we go, just getting them put in. Um, so just there they go, it's really fun. Um, you know, many people are repeat volunteers. And actually one thing that we're doing, which is kind of fun, we've got um, what we call our volunteer rewards program. And so we're giving out uh, SBPC branded swag that you can only get if you volunteer. And so I, our and so the, the volunteers that are online here, I, I see a number of you and you've already met the criteria. You've been out there five times. Uh, our t-shirts are in. So we'll be hanging those out soon. But we've talked about other stuff, maybe hoodies. Um, we've talked about like the uh, the lifeguard um, straw hats, you know, that they wear. And we're like with a logo, uh, maybe like a respect the natives or respect the locals, you know, stuff like that to make it kind of fun and to, to reward, reward the volunteers for all they do. Oh I, oh, I see. Um, I see Marsha on. Welcome, Marsha. You're another one of my um, long-term role models. I mean, thank you for all you've been doing forever. Um, we've we've been at it for a while at Biona, and thank you for what you and Roy continue to do to protect Biona. Uh, let's see some questions in here. Uh, let's see, San Francisco at Ocean Beach. I'm not sure what San Francisco is, but I'm sure we probably have it. <laughs> let's see, uh, Australia, Ice Planet, yeah. Yeah, PVLPC is a great source of green natives. And like I said, they're going to be, um, we've contracted with them. They go ahead and plant a number of our, our stuff from, you know, any seed they have. One thing I really want to get is the, um, the um, uh, Calabazia. And so if anyone has a source for that, please let me know. I want to get that one growing there. But uh, PVLPC doesn't have seeds right now. But if someone can provide seeds for them, they said they'd grow that, grow that for me. Um, Jim. Uh, yes, sir. Trip during the summer along Pershing Drive in front of the LAX airport uh -huh. on the roadside, you'll find lots of calabazia uh, fruits and, and a source for you. And you'd be getting a local, you know, um, gene type, genotype. I, I love it. So, so say where that's at again. So, Pershing Drive between yep. Imperial Highway and Playa del Rey, yep. right on the easy on the side of the road um, in the sandy soil, too. So, you already know it's going to like sandy soil. Okay. Um, the Calabazia, you know, the cucurbita that you uh -huh. were mentioning, mm -hmm. um, get, get their round fruits, coyote melons, and, and um, you know, just plant the seeds. Uh, I think they'll do well down there and they'll kind of play the role they'll kind of play the role that the ice plant played you know uh, i was going to say suggest something about the you know you mentioned artemisia californica not doing well and i'm not surprised um it's usually what gets chosen because it's a cheaper plant to buy by bulk as a native plant but it needs more of a clay soil so it's not going to really do well there in your dunes overall i would shy away from using that and I'd like to okay. see you experiment in some areas of leaving the ice plant and punching holes in it, because when you remove the ice plant, you sometimes get like a 10 to 20 to one ratio. Uh, you get rid of that one weed, but you get 10, 20 species of, of grasses and other annual weedy plants in their place, like the Russian thistle and that. And the ice plant, if left while you're planting the native plants, will uh, won't take away the moisture. If, if you study the ice plant root system, it looks like it's covering everything. You know, I mean, visually, when you look at it, you go, yeah, it's covering the area. But when you get down and look at it, and if you pull up some of the strands, you'll see that there's huge bare sand spaces underneath the ice plant that the roots of the ice plant are not taking in, but they're covering it. And you could get go through a transition period where and we noticed that Bayona, the wallflower, the very rare California state sensitive Ursimum suffratescens wallflower does really well when you still have remnant um, ice plant and abronia, the native abronia does well with the ice plant present. And then you could slowly over time remove the ice plant as your native plant cover is getting thicker. Um, and you might alleviate some of the, the whispering of people who, hey, getting rid of the green, you know, is, is just an, just something I've learned over the years, you know, of um, 
with thinking about ice plant and, and its ecology. No, I, you know, Roy, that you just made my night. That's, I think that, I, I, I will definitely do that because I will tell you what, I mean, where the ice plant was at um, in Polygons 10 and 11, where um, LACC took it out, it's just overtaken by a diversity of weeds right now. Um, so that's a great idea. And I know what you mean about the ice plant. You're right, the roots come kind of down and then it goes out prostate and spreads. So we'll do that. And also Artemisia, we got quite a lot of clay actually in the upper part of the bluffs there. So that's good to know. We can put some, and actually that big Artemisia you saw in one of the prior pictures is mm -hmm. near the top in the clayey soil. So I think, you know, I've learned a lesson because we planted the Artemisia below the fence line, which is primarily sand. So, and those aren't doing well. So thank you for both of those. Sure. Roy, There's we, we did experiment with that in Wilderness Park because they had a lot of ice plant on some of the first areas we planted. And what we found was um, we did not get a lot of weeds there. It wasn't a rainy year like this year. And it was much easier once you got the, the ice plant rolling to just strip it out than it was to plant, to dig out sections of it. And, and then try to pull it out later. In fact, we damaged quite a few plants by trying to pull the ice plant out later. Okay, you don't really need to pull it out, just find spaces, push it a little to the side and then you'll have a small hole for a native plant to go in. And the root systems of the ice plant won't be competing with it because they're at their focal points as um, you know, the long runners or prostate that Jim just mentioned too. But, Okay, maybe in your case, different geography, different, might be a different method, you know, what you found could work too. Yeah, I think I'm definitely going to try that though, Roy. I mean, I, I definitely see this as a, you know, a little bit of a science experiment um, and, and figure out what works best, you know, my, my, you know, what's the most efficient way to rewild as much space as possible. You know, that's what I really want to get to. So I will look for that. And then so only, only, only one, only one native plant, um, you know, is is um, on our state endangered species list on the uh, Santa Monica, Southern Santa Monica Bay sand dune, coastal strand uh, vegetation. It's called beach spectacle pod. It's in the mustard family, Dithraea meridima, and it was way back decades ago placed on the state endangered species list, and it was widespread from Redondo to Bayona, but um, we thought it was extinct. Then it was found to be in the sandy soils on San Nicolas Island and just north of Point Sal, uh, Pismo Beach sand dune soils. So we have two sources on which to recover the plant. And you might be able to get a sizable grant from conservancies, uh, uh, CNPS grant money, other federal grant money, you know, that you're going to bring back a state endangered um, plant to recover it to the to the South Bay sandy soils. So D-I-T-H-Y-R-A-E-A, -E Dithraea is the genus, Meridima, species epithet, it, beach spectacle pod. It, it would really catch the eye of all the different scientists and <laughs> botanists to know that, oh, you brought that back. You know, they, that would be a um, pretty neat thing. And thank of you, course, Roy, and thank you, Brentford. Go ahead. In the wallflower earlier, Ursimum, uh, that's a sensitive wallflower that's had a big, great decline, and it should be a focus of, it'll grow on sandy soils. There's a lot of it in the chevron, also going to do in blue butterfly. Um, and it, so it's a good nectaring plant and perch plant for, for also going to blue butterflies and um, does well in the poor sandy soils, you know. This is wonderful. No, I, I'm so glad. So, so definitely going to continue this conversation after tonight, because um, that's one thing I want to do too. Is right. I want to maximize the biodiversity at the bluffs, and we've got this plant palette that goes back, you know, two decades to um, what Travis and Ann put together. But yeah, if there's other things, I see Tony, you dropped something in the chat there. I'd like to find out what things can we plant there at the bluffs. So I'm going to talk with you, Roy, you, Tony, you, Marsha, <laughs> anybody else that wants to contact me, uh, please do, because I, I, I can see this is a, a collaborative effort where we really can um, expand the biodiversity. Great. Wonderful. Go, Jim. Go, Jim. <laughs> Go us. We're doing great. <laughs>
<laughs> Go <Yeah>. on. <laughs> All right. And here we are. This is our last volunteer day. So we're wrapping it up here. There's Jeff and there's our plants. So we had them all stored underneath the, uh, the um, restroom there. And um, here we are with our little cart. Thank you, Jim Light, for that cart. That's worth its weight in gold. Um, taking things up and down the, the cliffs there. And we and I always I use different colored flags every time. Um, so I can kind of keep track of what's planted where, when. Um, and now, my goodness, if you, I don't know if you recall, way at the beginning of our talk, right? There was all those wonderful wildflowers. <laughs> They're back from the seas, but my goodness, look at the weeds. It's just horrifying. So we've got uh, job security, as I mentioned. And so here's our here's our wonderful volunteers again, um, putting in planting the natives. Um, and this is near Avenue. You know, right Jim, now. Jim on the non-native grasses, um, they have a very soft seed coat. Mm -hmm. So um, ninety-five percent of those seeds that fall off these plants and during the late spring and summer, like right now, you're seeing them, the uh -huh. barley or the brome and all that. Those seeds, um, if they don't get to germinate the next spring, you've knocked down uh, ninety-five percent of the seed bank so if when they're young and growing and you can cut them off um pull them out before they go to seed you'll you'll reduce that non-native grass cover by 95 percent in the first year and the second third year you can really get down to virtually zero but you have to have a crew of people that are going to really go out and get all those young little grass seedlings when they look harmless you know you, you read my mind, Roy. That's where we're going to focus um, our next volunteer. And actually, um, actually, my, my crew that's on here, Kendra, and I think Jeff and Tom and Julian, I, we weren't going to go ahead and have an event for two weeks, but I think I'm going to schedule one this coming Saturday so we can get these weeds knocked down. So I think uh, next Saturday and the Saturday after we're going to have a couple of events because, yeah, like you said, it's an exponential thing. We can really get, you know, 90% of these things down um, by getting to them now. All right, um, so here we go. What I'm saying is, it's it's too it's too late. It's too late now to pull out the. the oh, is it really? Oh, it's already yeah. too late to get these guys. They're oh, already falling into the sand, and they're there for next year. You'd have to have a vacuum cleaner that's <laughs> pulling up oh. all the seeds. You're going, but in next wait, they're not they're not going to be visible during the summer. I mean, aesthetically, you'll it'll look like you removed them, but the seed bank's going to be there for next year. So, so it's next spring you have to start early or it may, if the, it depends on when the rains come if it starts raining in november december january then you got to start pulling the grass seedlings out early got it yeah. so it's already too late for these you'd say just basically leave these grasses in now because the damage is already done yeah yeah okay but aesthetically I aesthetically you might like not seeing them because then it highlights the native plants but it just depends on budgeting what volunteer hours and time you have. You really want to focus the pulling of when they're first sprouting in, in um, the late winter, you know, or beginning yeah. of winter and winter. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, yeah, we definitely focused on the Russian thistle earlier because that stuff's just nasty to work around. We want to, want to try and get that stuff knocked out. So we did that. But yeah, message received on, you know, getting these things earlier. So what we're kind of focusing on too, right? Because you're right, we have limited volunteer hours. So again, that defensible space thing we talked about, right? You know, these like little, you know, one, you know, one gallon pot, there are, some of them are already getting kind of overgrown. So we want to get back to the Southern end of Polygon 9, where we started way back in November and start just getting them, um, um protected and i see tony um saying you don't see them shattering yet so pull now and bag is the, the advice okay it doesn't hurt i think um yeah definitely okay we will i need a million volunteers you guys all want to come out on saturday <laughs> anyway all right let's let's get let's wrap this up here let me uh go through the, what we have left and leave some more time for questions these are all great questions and i knew this is the crowd we needed to chat with you guys have just filled my head full of great ideas. Um, and there's Julian on the right and um, a, a relative newcomer on the on the left. And look in the front, the foreground there, right? This is tons of weeds. Um, sea Rocket, and actually Julian can tell you all the different varieties are there because he was actually helping pull them out. So here we are, um, just pull, 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 weed, weed, weed. Um, there we go. And this is afterwards. So you got some nice peachy bean primrose in there. You got quite a few wildflowers. You know, we got poppies and um, I think some tidy tips were in there and blue eyed, baby blue eyes. 
So um, that's what it looks like. And we did, we focused on this corner because this is the, actually the Avenue I ramp. And we wanted this to be basically just wildflowers um, and, and native plants for people to see. And here we are, and the volunteers with their favorite invasives. So you can see there's a, a plethora to choose from. So now I'm gonna just end with a lot of really nice eye candy. Um, I went down yesterday just to get some really nice pictures of all the of all the um, the natives here. So there's a nice little baby blue eyes. There's some tidy tips. Um, unfortunately, there's a sea rocket there. Um, here's some poppies. Um, and this is the area that we actually um, seeded with all the um, the uh, wildflower seeds from last year. So, so yeah, back in December. So there's the primrose in front, which you know that's that's us coming back from here. But here, but we got the lupins in there and the poppies and such. And there's a really nice stand of lupins, right? But boy, look at the weeds. But the nice thing about the lupins, they can actually get up there um, and uh, and crowd things out, which is great. And yeah, Green, Rob, or, or Roy on the, on the beach burr, they're really doing well. And they're, LA County starting to like us because we're starting to help with their dune erosion, which is which is nice. And I really like this picture, you know, the tidy tip there with the, you know, the yellow against the purple. And there's some baby blue eyes and lupin, and then the primrose and the lupins. And um, this is up top and there's um, another nice shot. And I'll leave you all with this. This is a native habitat restoration work in progress, um, but all are welcome to join our restoration fund. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all. Um, you know, it's the support of the community, our local schools and all the orgs that we are working with, you know, collaborating with. It's really helping us reach every city in the South Bay and eventually beyond. And I definitely want to shout out again to all the volunteers. Um, you, you all are the best. I just, no matter how bad a mood I might be in from my work week, coming to the bluffs and working with you, having fun with you all in the sand is, um, you know, you got the, you got the beach, you got the surf. Yeah. It's all, it's wonderful. So thank you all. Um, so um, with that, there's our email um, addresses. So feel free to shoot Jim and myself um, email. Um, and um, with that, I think we'll take final questions. And I do want to say, you know, again, thank you all. I and mean, SCC and PS, what you've been doing for years. You know, I think I, I feel, and I, I think you probably all do, right, as well. A tipping point. I really feel like we're getting momentum now and people are becoming very well um, aware of the value of natives. You know, the rich biodiversity that California has over 6,000 native plants statewide and how we all can do our part to uh, protect, preserve, and expand um, our beautiful native biodiversity in California. So thank you all. All right. Well, thank thank you, Jim and Jim. There were a lot of questions in chat and you kind of handled them all at once. I see Adela has got a, a, a question. I had this question too. She says, when you scatter seeds, do you use the coastal poppy variety, which is yellow orange, we saw in that one photo of remnant poppies versus the foothill poppy, which is all dark orange. So Maritima variety or just whatever you've got. No, that's correct. We went to SS, SNS seeds and got the Maritima. We definitely want to get the uh, Tony um, instilled that into me many years ago. <laughs> that's when actually, again, I'll just give a shout out to Tony. It's too bad you're not don't have your business anymore because um, you know your natural landscapes class. You know, was for business. It was great to get the local local plants here. So yeah, we 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 focus. We want hyper local as much as possible, and that's why eventually, right? We want to have our own nursery where we're basically growing exclusively native plants from native seed um, and not going to places like Native West or Tree of Life or what have you. All right, looks like Gerard is going to uh, tell his swim group all about the backstory behind these, the bluff restoration. He says he sees this as he swims and runs and walks along the beach and he didn't know uh, till now. So I guess that's a, that's a good way to spread the message. And uh, Roy says, great presentation, great work at healing the coast. I agree. Um, and then, uh, oh, D says, what are the three seed locations? Tree of Life, PVPLC, and what was the third one? Um, Native West. They're also down in Orange County. Oh, okay. So Native West. Yeah, they're great. They, they have some really nice, um, nice stock. I've been pretty happy with all three of the providers we've had. But I, as I said again, go ahead. And because of the volume we get, we get a pretty good, pretty good discount. And they, they cut us a break on deliveries, too. All right. You guys seem to have got it going on. So best of luck to you. Uh, let's stay in touch. And I think I'm going to call the meeting. Uh, 
More thanks from uh, Kendra Ferraro. Thank you, Kendra. You're the best. And um, just kind of scrolling back up to see if we overlooked anything. I think we did that. You guys were blowing the chat yeah. up. <laughs> Mary, Mary Simon is reminding everyone that uh, southbayparks.org is your website. Yeah. Uh, just as, as in as an email there as well. So uh, think, Karen, oh yeah, you, yeah, you already mentioned that. I think you said, right, how to learn about volunteer opportunities. Yeah, if you go to southbayparks.org, you can click on our projects link and you can volunteer at all our various sites, you know, and, um, right. you know, again, and a lot has been added to that. So Roy, recently. Yeah, Roy's got a comment about uh, a, some fairly esoteric knowledge, I, I believe. He says that Alondra Park, do not forget Malvella Leprosa, Alkali Mallow, to protect the population on the island. So, yeah, it's an it's an ancient it's an ancient population. There's several hundred plants there. They're there. You'll find them listed as a weed, but it's native, and it represents the end of the Pleistocene and the clay adobe soils of the South Bay, and it represents the it's probably you know so eight thousand years is how the alkali mallow at Alondra Island. The rest of the park doesn't have it, but even just beyond the boundary of Alondra Park on some roadsides around residential homes, you'll see little remnant little patches of the alkali mallow. And it's it's an important pollinator plant. Bumblebees like the white flowers of it. And it's easy to think, oh, just get rid of it, you know, but um, Jean Bellman has done really good with her native planting garden and the alkali mallow has been able to survive alongside it. But it's, it's and I added seaside heliotrope to the alkali mallow, knowing that they live together ecologically in various places. So that population spreading, but that's introduced native, native that I introduced uh, beside heliotrope back because it would have been there historically. But that alkali mallow has lost 99% of its habitat in the South Bay. You know, there's still a lot at um, the, the Madrona Park, Madrona Marsh, yes. Right. Not a lot. There's not a lot at, Alco at Madrona Marsh, but there's a few patches. Oh, there down. is, there's quite a bit. Okay. Oh, that's Tony. Hi, Tony. Yeah, you're right. There's a fair, fair amount. Yeah. But it spreads uh, with rhizomes, so it's uh, there's some big patches yeah. of it. If, if. <laughs> well, I'd like Julian. to download your brain, Roy. Uh, okay. And Marsha, good to see you online. And she didn't even know uh, about South Bay Parks, and now she does, I guess. No, unbelievable. I did not know. So great to know who you are now. Besides. <laughs> Oh, and then Julian's complaining that the alkali mallow leaves resemble cheeseweed. I've got to agree. Cheeseweed kind of looks like a mallow, and you got to look a little carefully. Once, once you learn it, once you learn the difference, you'll know it forever, you know, in terms of how to tell them apart. The cheeseweed and the alkali mallow, they have a similar leaf, but the flower is quite different, and the flowering phenology of when they flower is different, too. Yeah. But if you pull out the alkali mallow, it just comes back because it's uh, spreading with rhizomes. That's right. There's a rare butterfly in the uh, California, thing. California's most famous lepidopterist or from UC Davis. I uh, forget his name right now, but I shouldn't forget it. But he, I, he and I talked and he thinks that it covered huge parts of the San Joaquin Valley and Sacramento Valley. And that's what this rare butterfly was associated with. And he's pretty sure that the alkali mallow has a tuberous sort of woody um, fibrous root that even if you pull it out as Tony's saying or whatever you pull it out it'll still come back up because you can't it's really hard to get rid of it but when you do massive housing development and deep digging you can lose lose populations and that's how we lost 95 percent of it in the south bay and we've lost most of it in the Imperial Valley because of agriculture. And we've lost almost all of it in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's bidding, it's not gonna get listed by CNPS because there's still some amount of it. And it's not, it's got a perception of not being, of being invasive as a native. And, but we don't wanna lose that plant. I posted okay. a link into Calscape for alkali mallow for those that are want to click on it. But I think that brings us to a wrap. It's about 9.01. Thank you all for attending. Any last questions? All right. I love the, I love the chat tonight. It was uh, very informative and I love the talk too. Thank you so much, Jim and Jim. Thank you for the opportunity. We appreciate it and all the input.
we'll definitely be uh, comparing notes there. Trying to, uh, to, to do better. <laughs> Yeah, let me add my thanks as well. You, you all are the best. I, I love this community. People who love native plants are great people. Yeah, native plant people are good. So thank you all. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'll end the meeting. Have a good night.